Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls, and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, Series 2000. This week, I'm excited to visit The Mummy Walks. This book was completely unknown to me, and now I know why. Not a whole lot happens in this one. Stein spends a lot of time establishing an interesting, albeit convoluted setup, and then just kind of lets the story get away from him. It didn't feel like a Goosebumps book, and I'm just going to spoil it now. We never see this mummy walk. This book is engaging in its own way, but it's still a huge bait and switch, so if you've never read this one, just skip it honestly. This 1999 cover is easily the weakest of the various mummy books we've seen so far. It's just too cartoony for me, and it doesn't measure up to the other Series 2000 covers. Although, it's appropriate in the sense that it's kind of a lame cover for a lame book. Also, not surprising, there's no merchandise for this one. Our front tag says, One small step for mummy, which is a play on the iconic Neil Armstrong quote, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But let's check out the back of this book. I didn't see a flight attendant as I stepped into the plane, but my seat was easy to find. It was the very first seat in the front row of the first class section. I fiddled with my seatbelt. Then I remembered the envelope my mom had given me. Did my mom and dad write me a letter? I tore open the envelope and pulled out a sheet of paper. My heart skipped a beat as I gazed in shock at the short message. We are not your parents. Okay, let's start this summary. The book opens with an introduction to Michael Clark, and he's currently being shuffled through JFK Airport by his parents, who are shipping him off to Orlando, Florida to visit his Aunt Sandra. His parents are exceptionally nervous about him flying alone, but Michael seems fine with it, especially since he's flying first class and looking forward to some ice cream sundaes. Michael is stoked for this trip because he's going to visit Disney World, and he's also interested in SeaWorld. He's all about fish and life under the sea. Remember, it's 1999, so Blackfish hasn't been released and no one hates SeaWorld yet. The family reaches their gate together, because once again it's 1999, so we're operating on pre-9-11 airport rules. The parents hug Michael goodbye and are about to watch him board the plane. However, right before getting on the plane, his mom hands him a plain white envelope. I assumed this contained cash, considering he's flying first class and off to Disney, but when Michael opens it on the plane, he's shocked to discover that the note reads, We are not your parents. Michael's parents are always teasing him about his appearance because he looks nothing like them, so he's wondering if this is some sort of joke. Things get weirder for him quickly though, because he realizes this plane is too quiet and there's no one else in first class. He pulls back the plane curtain and sees there's literally no one else on this plane, so he thinks he must have boarded the wrong plane by mistake or something. While reaching for his duffel bag, the plane door slams shut and the plane soon backs away from the gate. Michael tries banging on the cockpit door while screaming for help, but it's locked and no one answers him. An announcement reminds him to buckle up and take a seat, so Michael reluctantly does. This is one of the odder setups for a Goosebump story, so I was pretty excited to see where this story was headed. While wondering what the hell is going on, Michael glances out of the airplane window and can see they're flying out across the Atlantic Ocean, so now he's really freaking out. I was guessing he's off to Egypt, but Michael doesn't know he's in a book with a mummy on the cover, so he's still clueless. The cockpit door slowly starts to open, and Michael is face to face with a mystery man in camo and khaki. He has pins and badges on his breast pocket, so Michael knows he's military of some nature. When he asks the man what the fuck is going on, the man just silences him and tells Michael that everything will be revealed in time. He goes on to say his name is Lieutenant Henry and tries to offer Michael a sandwich for lunch. Michael is not in the mood for a meal and keeps insisting there has to be some sort of mistake, to which Lieutenant Henry replies that there has been no mistake and refers to Michael as Your Excellency. Michael concludes he's trapped on a plane with a crazy man, and the story just cuts to later in the night with him struggling to fall asleep on the plane. He's still trying to piece together all these strange events, but is unsuccessful. The next morning, he catches a glimpse of a worried looking pilot and wonders if maybe this plane has been hijacked. He then eats some breakfast while staring out the window and wonders what desert they're currently flying over. They eventually land at a small airport and Lieutenant Henry informs Michael that they're off to visit General Ramir, but still won't explain what's going on. While walking out of the airport, they pass a group of men in white robes and camouflage who all clap and cheer for Michael as he passes by, further confusing him. Michael is definitely royalty of some kind. He hops into a limo and meets General Ramir and proceeds to freak out on the guy demanding to know what on earth is going on and begs to see his parents. General Ramir just coldly tells Michael that his parents are dead, which stuns Michael briefly. He then remembers the note about how his parents are not actually his parents, and General Ramir informs him that the Clarks are okay, so Michael's mystery birth parents are the ones who are dead. This matters less to him. General Ramir then provides a little more clarity, and we learn that the Clark smuggled Michael away as a baby to keep him safe after his birth parents were killed in a war. There are a lot of wars on this planet, so Michael needs some more information, and we learn this is the nation of Jezekiah, and they've been in a struggle against rebel forces for control. 
Furthermore, this is Michael's nation, as in he's the royal prince of it, which is why everybody's been calling him your excellency. And now that the war is finishing, it's finally safe for him to return to claim his throne. That's a lot of information for both Michael and the reader to take in. Definitely not the relatable average kid goosebump story. General Ramirez informs Michael that they're on their way to his new home, the Royal Palace, but Michael's gonna have to pass some sort of test which involves locating the mummy. The limo then pulls up to a massive palace and Michael can barely process what's happening given the day's events. It then hops to later in the day and General Ramirez is sharing some more information on this mummy situation. He clarifies that the people of Jezekiah used to make mummies just like the ancient Egyptians. I guess this is to give the reader a frame of reference for what kind of mummy we should be dealing with. The mummy Michael has to locate is the body of Emperor Pukra, and it's supposed to be the oldest mummy in existence, which is quite the claim to make given the nature of mummified bodies. Michael's birth parents, the king and queen of Jezekiah, hid the mummy along with the Jezekiah Sapphire at the start of the war 12 years ago, and no one's been able to locate them since. This Jezekiah Sapphire is apparently so rare and valuable that the nation's entire currency depends on it. So if Michael can't locate the mummy with the sapphire, his entire country is doomed. Don't worry though, General Ramir informs Michael that his parents made sure to plant a memory chip inside his brain as a baby so he could find the mummy in case they didn't survive. What kind of technology are we inventing here? Is this supposed to take place in the future or an alternative universe? No, it's just lazy writing. Michael does not seem as bothered by this supposed brain implant as I would be, but he does fake a fainting spell to buy himself more time after General Ramir demands to know the location of the mummy. Michael is then led to his living quarters to rest, where he spots a telephone and decides he needs to call his parents to see if any of this is true. Unfortunately for him, when he picks up the phone, he's met with his own personal operator, who can't allow him to call his parents or his Aunt Sandra. Michael decides to try to sneak out of his room, but discovers he's locked in with a guard posted outside the door. He flops onto his bed defeated when he hears shuffling behind a curtain. He investigates and comes across a girl his age, who introduces herself as Megan Kerr. We learn that Megan is also an American and that her parents were advisors to General Ramir, but they were killed in an explosion during the war. Since Megan had no other family, General Ramir adopted her and she's been trapped in this palace ever since, missing her old American life. Megan warns him that he's in danger because General Ramir wants nothing but power, and once Michael finds the mummy and the sapphire, he will be killed. Michael's like, well, good thing I don't know where this mummy or the sapphire is. But that also concerns Megan because she says they'll just torture you anyways until they get the answers that they want. It's a lose-lose situation. Then, two guards burst into the room and drag Megan away before she can tell him anything else. Michael spends some more time trying to convince himself that they have the wrong kid, because if he really did have a memory chip in his brain, wouldn't he remember where this mummy is? Given that this is fake technology, it's hard to tell whether Michael has a point here or not. It then occurs to him to check the door to see if the guards remembered to lock it while dragging Megan away. Lucky for Michael, they didn't lock it and he takes off down the palace corridors, running blindly. He spends some time dodging guards and hiding behind curtains when he's inspired by a dragonfly to make an escape out the window. This goes nowhere though, because the moment Michael leans out the open window, he's snatched back inside by two guards and taken to General Ramir. Michael is waiting to get his ass chewed by the general. Instead, Ramir just laughs and congratulates him on being so courageous and thinks that kind of bravery is what they need in a future king. He then takes Michael over to a wall of maps detailing the kingdom of Jezekiah, which appears to be mostly made of deserts and caves. This all culminates in General Ramir wanting Michael to point to which cave contains the mummy and the sapphire. When Michael has no idea which cave to pick, General Ramir is like, that's fine, we'll just have our doctors cut open your brain and remove the memory chip, since it's not working anyways. Naturally, Michael is not a big fan of this plan and starts to panic. He eventually is tossed back into his room, where he's then visited by Lieutenant Henry. They essentially have the same conversation Michael just had with General Ramir, and Michael again insists he has no idea where the mummy and the sapphire are located. It's very redundant. Lieutenant Henry then ends this conversation by ordering the guards to haul Michael off to surgery. A few paragraphs later, Michael's in a dressing gown and strapped to a metal table as surgeons outline where they want to cut him and inform him how they're going to be removing chunks of his skull. Right before being given the sleeping gas, Michael feels inspired and declares he knows where to find the mummy and the sapphire. He's then led to the general's office, where he just points to a random cave on the wall and is like, here it is, behind a stone wall in the back of this cave. This buys himself only a little time because he's then informed he'll be joining everyone on a cave expedition first thing in the morning. That night, Michael can't sleep and around 2am he's visited by Megan, who sneaks through an open window. She informs him that there's four guards outside his door, so he shouldn't plan on any sort of escape. She also wants to know if he's telling the truth because she says if he's lying he'll regret it since General Ramir and his men are full on desperate. She then asks if he's aware of the mummy's curse, which of course he isn't. 
Megan informs him that if Emperor Pukra's body falls into evil hands, he will come to life until the evil is destroyed. The general and his men are all so superstitious that they're absolutely certain that they can't rule Jezekiah until they have possession of this mummy. Michael thinks he already has enough to worry about without now having to deal with a cursed mummy and decides to lie to Megan about knowing the mummy's location, not because he doesn't trust her, but he doesn't want her to get in trouble too when everybody realizes he's making shit up. The next morning, Michael's outside where he's greeted by a full army that will be joining them to the caves. The rebels aren't completely defeated, so there's still the possibility of an attack. He then rides in a jeep with Megan and General Romere. The entire journey, he feels like he's on an alien planet as he admires the endless sand dunes. They eventually reach some white granite cliffs, and Michael can tell they're getting closer to the caves. He keeps trying to find some time to chat with Megan, but the guards are listening to their every word. They reach the cave Michael chose at random, and he decides now is the perfect time to confess to making the whole thing up. However, in true Goosebumps fashion, General Ramir didn't hear a word Michael said, because they're suddenly under attack by rebel forces. Michael dodges bullets and dies behind a boulder. He then spends some time listening to gunfire, and he can hear men screaming out in pain. It becomes real to him that he really is in the middle of a full-on war. He then seizes this opportunity to make his escape. He had spotted some smaller cities just outside Jezekiah on the right across the desert, and thinks he can head there for help. I feel like Michael is underestimating the danger of crossing a desert completely unprepared, but that's just me. He doesn't make it far before Lieutenant Henry catches him and lets him know that the rebels have retreated, so there's no reason to run away now. Once back at the cave, he spots Megan getting her ass chewed by General Ramir because he's upset she didn't do a better job at hiding from the rebel gunfire, leading Michael to realize that the general really does care about Megan. Michael is now feeling extremely guilty that all these people are risking their lives to protect him and to locate their sacred mummy while he's just making shit up. He wants to know if they'll be heading into the cave now, but General Ramir is like, no, we must first purify ourselves with the clean sand of our ancestors, so the mummy doesn't attack us when we find him, which will take hours. I'd like to know how people purify themselves with sand, and I'm in luck because we spend a few paragraphs as everyone does chanting and buries themselves in the sand, so it's just a sea of little heads poking up out of the sand. Eventually, they all crawl out of their little holes and dust themselves off before heading to bed, because they won't be entering the cave until the morning. Michael again considers running away, but the campsite is loaded with guards on alert for any signs of rebel forces. The next morning, General Ramir and Michael finally lead a group into the cave, so we can hopefully get some mummy action. Pretty quickly, they come across a stone wall, just like Michael said there would be. Michael himself is also surprised by this, considering he just made it up. The general orders the men to tear down the wall, while Michael just nervously waits for everyone to discover his lie. A few paragraphs later, Michael is now face to face with the mummy, Emperor Pukra. The cave erupts into chanting as everybody celebrates. Michael's feeling relieved and incredibly lucky. However, this joy is short-lived because suddenly the mummy starts to move. This means the mummy has fallen into evil hands and is ready to destroy whoever gets in its way. General Ramir and his men all flee the cave screaming, while Michael just stands there dumbfounded at this cursed mummy. The mummy marches over, grabs Michael by the throat, lifts him off the ground, and then starts squeezing. Things get silly though, because surprise, this mummy is just Megan. I had noticed she wasn't around these last few pages, so I somewhat expected this. We learned the previous night she thought Michael could be lying, so she snuck into the cave and saw that there was no mummy. She then wrapped herself up in an elaborate mummy costume, and I assume crafted herself a wall of rocks, despite that being completely impractical. But this is Goosebumps, so we're just going with it. The two kids stand there celebrating their victory, but Megan thinks Michael could potentially locate the actual Emperor Pukra because she still doesn't know that Michael can't remember shit. This happy moment is then interrupted by some rebels, who recognize Michael as the future king and Megan as the general's daughter and decide to kidnap them. The kids are loaded into a van and are soon racing across the desert while some rebels stare at them coldly with rifles in their hands. Megan warns Michael that they're in more danger than ever because these rebels are capable of anything. After an hour of van travel, they're hauled into a rebel camp where they're introduced to General Moham, and we learn General Moham and General Ramir are cousins. This doesn't really end up being important at all though. General Moham wastes no time and orders that Michael be sent to an operating tent because they want to get this memory chip once and for all. This memory chip stuff feels so out of place in the context of the rest of the story, but it's whatever. Michael takes off running for a couple of pages, but doesn't get very far before he's surrounded by rebel forces and taken back into the operating tent. He's once again strapped down and prepares to have his head chopped open when the doctors inform him they're just going to take an x-ray first. This seems very reasonable, considering the last doctors were just going to start digging around in his brain. We then spend some time with Michael strapped to a table while he gets irritated by a fly walking around on his forehead while he waits for the results. Stein felt it was necessary to include this fly scene, so I did too. This book doesn't suffer from heavy padding, but it does have its moments. 
Michael is taken to General Moham, and he wonders where they've taken Megan. General Moham informs him that there's no memory chip in his brain, so he thinks Michael is a useless imposter. He then orders the guards to take Michael out to the desert to be killed. A man named Raul suddenly jumps in and is like, this boy's a US citizen, we don't want any trouble with the US government once we've taken back control of Jezekiah. But General Moham is like, eh, we'll just blame it on General Ramir, and orders Michael to be tossed into the python pit. We then spend a chapter as Michael is marched towards the edge of the snake pit, and he watches the pythons squirm all over each other as they fight their way to the top of the pile. Just before Michael's about to be tossed in, Megan comes running and shouting that she has an idea. The next chapter opens with Michael and Megan gazing out of a plane window. We get a clunky explanation on this escape. Megan told General Moham to send both her and Michael back to the United States, so General Ramir will think they've been kidnapped, and he'll be so stressed out about his missing daughter that he'll stop focusing on the war, so the rebels can have a chance to take back Jezekiah. It's a mess. This is when it all becomes very clear this book is going straight down the toilet and the last hundred pages have kind of been a giant waste of time. Megan also informs Michael that the rebels don't actually feed people to the pythons. It was just a scare tactic to see if Michael knew anything else about the mummy's location. Michael then asks Megan what she's going to do when they arrive in New York, considering she's an orphan, and she doesn't really know yet, so he invites her to live with him and his family. This then causes him to wonder if his parents actually expect him to come back. Once at the airport in New York, he calls his mom, and she seems shocked to hear from him. The kids are picked up from the airport, and once back at his house, Michael races around the house excited to be home. There's only a handful of pages left, so it's like, okay, where are we going with all this? Where's the fucking mummy? Michael sits down with his parents and explains everything that happened, including having his head x-rayed and searched for a memory chip. Michael thinks they're just going to confirm he's not actually the future king of Jezekiah, but his parents are like, it's all true, we're actually not your parents. They go on to say that he was sent to them as a baby with a memory chip in his head, but they had it removed when he was still a baby because they didn't want it ruining his life. They had hoped when he arrived to Jezekiah without a chip, General Ramir would have just sent him back to the US. Michael is shocked and not nearly as angry as he should be, considering his parents put him through a whole lot of shit while just hoping it would all turn out fine. His dad then says there's one more thing he needs to show Michael and leads him to the basement. They move a large antique chest and reveal a secret door. This room doesn't contain vampire breath, but it does contain a sarcophagus. His dad opens the lid, revealing the mummy of Emperor Pukra. The mom then goes on to say they smuggled both the mummy and the sapphire when they brought Michael back to America, because no one would ever think to check their basement for it. Michael goes to bed and sleeps soundly, relieved to finally have had all this drama behind him. The next morning, he wakes up to find Megan missing with a note on the vanity mirror that reads, Michael, I hope you will not think I'm a bad person. I enjoyed our adventures together, and I enjoyed getting to know you. I'm afraid I told you one little lie. You see, my new father, General Ramir, and I are very close. We love each other, and I will do anything to help him. I have to confess, I did not sneak in your room at the palace. He sent me to spy on you. This is why I was allowed to travel anywhere you went. When I pretended to be Pukra's mummy in the cave, I did it to make you trust me. We knew you were the right boy. I thought if you trusted me, you'd tell me the truth. We would try anything to find out where Pukra was hidden. And so, I've been working for my father the whole time. I'm sorry I had to lie to you. You're a great guy. I hope you will understand. Your friend Megan. Michael races to tell his parents, who then fly downstairs to check on the mummy in the sapphire, but find nothing down there except another note that reads, The Mummy Walks Again. And that's how this disappointing book ends. Talk about wasted potential with this one. Overall, I thought The Mummy Walks was a pretty odd book. I was fully invested in the story and definitely wasn't bored. However, as the end of the story crept closer and closer, without any mummy action, I became increasingly disappointed. This book just didn't do it for me and I felt like there was a lot of build up for very little payoff. I literally double checked to make sure there wasn't a sequel I had forgotten about or something. I'm going to give this one 2 out of 5 sapphires. In a lot of ways this book was well crafted but it just massively flubbed the entire third act. It kind of reminded me of reading The Abominable Snowman of Pasadena, where I was fully on board with the story, and then quickly wasn't. As far as the vomit count goes, there were no new vomits in The Mummy Walks, but I do need to amend the count because I forgot an instance of vomit last week in Scream School, so thank you to Spongy in the comments for catching that. This puts the series 2000 total at 12. Well, that's it for The Mummy Walks. I feel like a parent with this one where it's like, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. Next week is The Werewolf in the Living Room, and we finally have a book again that I can kind of remember reading. It may even be the very last Goosebumps book I read before I was off into the world of Stephen King. Let me know in the comments what you thought of The Mummy Walks. Were you entertained by this one? Why do you think Stein decided to forego any mummy action? Where the fuck did the mummy end up if it's not wandering around the house? Also, what did you think of all my mummy clips this week? Making this video made me realize that I desperately want Tales from the Crypt to be streaming somewhere, 
but I might just have to invest in the DVDs. Anyways, as always, thanks again for watching and make sure you subscribe for... The Brad. The Love.